Hi, I really hope you enjoy this educational video. My name is Mark Bilek. I'm a certified financial planner, and my team and I focus on developing tax efficient or tax free retirement strategies for our clients. We also focus on investment strategies that allow folks to eliminate the worry and have the potential growth that you need in retirement. So enjoy the video, and at the end, I'll tell you how you can schedule a no cost, no obligation consultation with me. Enjoy. Okay, and people are starting to come in, David. So I've been told that um, I shouldn't jump right into it from my staff who watches every one of these webinars because it seems like we're, uh, some people are getting cut off and they're not getting the information. So um, we're just gonna give it a couple minutes while people are lying in here. We got a big group tonight um, and we've got uh, a really great uh, resource and speaker. Um, everybody's been hearing me talk about this for a couple of weeks now. Those of you who have been on my webinars, I appreciate everybody attending these webinars. I told you before, this is, you know, when we started having these issues with COVID-19 and the market started dropping and then everybody, you know, had to stay in their home. Uh, I thought it might be a good idea to set up a webinar just to stay in touch with everybody at Thursdays at 4 p.m. And then um, we add it Tuesdays at 10 a.m. just to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to, to hear it. And I got to tell you, it's been a lot of fun for me. And I've gotten a lot of great, um, great responses from people and great guests like you, David. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, so everybody, I want to uh, introduce David McKnight, who's been with us, uh, or who, who's with us tonight. Uh, you've heard me talk about David. You've seen his bio. Uh, in the emails that you received in the Facebook posts that uh, perhaps you've received. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about David. I'm, and then I'm going to tell you how we met. Uh, you know that, let me get this book here. You know that David wrote this book among others. And this book, The Power of Zero, has literally changed lives, including mine. Um, and that's just not me saying it. When the when this book was launched the week of September, uh, in September 2018, it was the number two most sold business book when it launched. Uh, Forbes lists uh, The Power of Zero as the number nine best financial resource in the country. Um, there's been over 225,000 copies of The Power of Zero sold, and uh, David has appeared in the New York Times, the USA Today uh, publications on Market Watch, Kiplinger's. Uh, Reuters, Fox Business, but most importantly, he and his lovely wife, Felice, have seven kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, David and I have had the, the pleasure of spending some time together. And David knows that um, while I appreciate how many that is, seven kids, we know that I'm the youngest of 13, David. So <laughs> I, I say I always win this one. But I don't have seven kids, so I give you high credit. Um, I want to tell everybody before we get started, and thank again, David, for being here, but how I met David, how we met. So um, you've all heard my story, most of you, about um, how I got involved with the um, with meeting Ed Slot, and now Ed is a mentor of mine and a part of his Master at Lead Advisor group, and that's been wonderful for my clients, my staff, my practice, and many of you have heard um, about Ed Slot. And before I go into that, I just remind, want to remind everybody that everyone is muted, um, there will be a question and answer opportunity in, in this uh, presentation, and uh, we're going to save the questions to the end, but that doesn't mean I want you to wait until the end to type your questions. Type your questions as we're going because you might forget about things. Now, those questions might be answered, and we can address it, but um, type your questions, please, as we go. Um, David may have the opportunity to ask for hands raised, and you can you can raise your hand in the, uh, in this um, uh the toolbar at the bottom of your screen there. But um, so that, that should set us up for a well-run webinar. But let me again uh, explain to you or go back to explaining how I met David. So as part of Ed Slot Elite Advisor Group, we have to attend two training events every single year. And I know that sounds exciting to go for two and a half days to learn about tax law updates and IRA distributions. And it can be exciting and it can be fun. I remember though sitting in the back of one of these training events and David got up on stage and he, in front of us was a copy of the Power of Zero book. Um, and David started presenting uh, something like what you're gonna hear tonight. And I, I again remember sitting in the back of the class after 
working with hundreds of clients after being in the business for uh, over a decade, after being um, receiving my certified financial planner designation, which I'm very proud of. Again, I sat in the back of the class thinking, my gosh, this guy has it figured out. And he's got a great way of handing the message out to individuals and uh, application of these vitally important strategies. Everyone who's taken the class that we do under the Changing World of Retirement, I tell you that Changing World of Retirement is based on this Power of Zero book and it's written by David McKnight and his group. And I've taught hundreds of people that course. And my goal is to, whether, whether those people who attend that course have me implement their strategies or not, it's to bring these things to light to help as many people as possible avoid these potential issues. So with that introduction, I'm gonna ask everybody to help us uh, say hello to David, and I'm gonna turn it over to David McKnight. David, thank you for being here. Well, Mark, it's an honor to be with you, and um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to talk to um, the, the people that you've invited to this webinar. Uh, I, just as a, as a um, sort of word of um, clarification, everything that we, you can see the title there, How to Build a Zero, a zero Tax Retirement, with new commentary on the impact of coronavirus. Everything that we talk about tonight um, is being magnified and amplified by the coronavirus and the economic disruption that has resulted uh, from it. So um, I think it's timely that we're, we're, we're able to have this discussion uh, with you all tonight. And uh, hopefully we can sort of convey a sense of urgency uh, that we now have uh, even greater sense of urgency to implement some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, normally how this, how this you know, presentation goes, I do about 90 of these presentations live every year. It's a very interactive presentation, unfortunately, given the constraints of cyberspace. Uh, we're not going to be able to have me ask questions and then you, you answer them. Um, but as I ask a question, I want you to sort of reflect upon it and, and um, sort of answer in your own mind, um, you know, what your gut tells you as to the, 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 the true answer to that question. And then we'll proceed through this. And then whatever questions you have at the end, we'll be able to answer those one by one. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. Uh, and I usually like to start off with a quiz. And the first question on the quiz is this. Can anybody tell me the highest tax bracket in the history of our country? What's the worst it's ever been? Well, the last two years of World War II, the highest marginal tax bracket was 94%. And that was for any dollar you made above and beyond $200,000. Now, $200,000 back then was a pretty big deal. It was about $3.2 million in today's dollars. Can you even think of anybody back then that made that type of money? Well, you had the, you know, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Kennedys. Well, there was an actor who later became a politician. Can you think of who that was? That's right, it was Ronald Reagan. If you study Ronald Reagan's biography, he talks about how he never made more than two movies in a year, reason being he made about $100,000 per movie, and any dollar he made above and beyond $200,000, he only kept six cents on the dollar. Truth be told, he didn't even get to keep the six cents. Who do you think got the six cents? That wasn't his, it wasn't Nancy, it wasn't his agent, it actually went to the state of California to pay for state tax. Um, so that was a long time ago. Let's fast forward to the decade of the 70s. What was the worst federal marginal tax bracket you could pay throughout the entire decade of the 70s? Well, folks, this one's easy to remember. Throughout the entire decade of the 70s, the worst federal marginal tax bracket you could pay was? That's right, 70%. Once again, for any dollar, you made above and beyond $200,000. Now let's fast forward to today, 2020. What is the highest marginal uh, tax bracket you can pay today? The tax rate at which Bill Gates pays taxes on most of his earned income. That's right, it's 37%. So here's my question for you, and this is not a trick question. How does 37% stack up against some of these tax rates we experience in the past? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> it's pretty low, and it's interesting you might think that, because I do this workshop, like I said, all across the country, and I routinely ask rooms full of people, how bad are taxes today? And what do you think they say? They say horrible, uh, terrible, just as bad as they've ever been. What well, the truth is that tax rates today are just about as low as we've seen in our lifetime. However, something is going to happen to that tax bracket January 1st, 2026. Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? 
it's going to go up. What's it going to go up to? It's gonna go up to 39.6. Uh, and guess what? In order for that to happen, all Congress has to do is nothing. Is Congress pretty good at doing nothing? I'll say. Well, it's 39.6 enough to keep me awake at night. Well, 39.6 is what tax rates were throughout the entire decade of the 90s. Anybody remember how, how the stock market was doing in the 90s? It was doing great. In fact, if you dropped $100,000 into the S&P 500 in 1990, took a nap for nine years, woke up in 1999, any idea what that 100,000 had been worth? It would have been worth $600,000. Your money would have sextupled uh, uh, during the decade of the 90s alone, and that's under these types of tax rates. So again, 39.6 is not enough to keep me awake at night. The real question I have for you, however, is this. What is likely to happen to tax rates beyond 2026 as we move forward in time to 2028, 2030 and beyond? What does your gut tell you? Are tax rates down the road likely to be higher or lower? than 39.6. Well, most people at this point, you know, I asked rooms full of people, uh, a lot of those hands will go up and I'll say, why? Why will tax rates go up? What will uh, the federal government be spending money on that could literally force tax rates to go up? And usually the first one uh, we, we get is we talk about the debt. How much debt do we owe? Well, it's $24 trillion. It's a two and a four followed by 12 zeros. Uh, we owe some of that money to ourselves, we borrowed some of it from Social Security, but who else do we owe a lot of that money to? That's right, China. Um, I don't know if you guys realize this, but just recently the US Treasury came out with a new $100 bill. Did you guys see that? Uh, I think it's because China's got all the old ones. A little tax humor for you there. Uh, so, the, so we got the debt, uh, we got the interest on the debt, we got Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, defense. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, let's talk about the CARES Act. You know, the single largest stimulus package in the history of our country up till 2008 was, was the bailout of 2008. And that was about $850 billion. That was the single largest bailout in the history of the world. Well, guess what? The CARES Act dwarfs it by comparison. Uh, it's 2.2 trillion. They reserve the right to spend another 4 trillion at their leisure. And there, a rumor is there are more stimulus packages in the works. So, all of this stuff that we're talking about, it's all accelerating because of what's transpired just in the last month alone. Uh, there's pensions. You know, the other day I talked to this lady, I said, hey, uh, what happens to your pension if your company goes broke? She says, oh, don't worry. No matter what happens to my company, the federal government guarantees I will always receive two thirds of my pension every year till I die. Folks, that's what we call an unfunded obligation. What's an unfunded obligation? It's a promise the federal government's made that they can't afford to deliver. Um, some economists say that the amount, that the, the amount of money the federal uh, government's promised that they can't afford to deliver is about 120 trillion. But I wanna bring your attention to a guy named Larry Kotlikoff. He's a PhD out of Boston University. He's a foremost expert on what we call fiscal gap accounting. What is fiscal gap accounting? Well, fiscal gap accounting projects out over the next 75 years everything that our federal government has promised to pay for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the national debt, so on and so forth. They project out over the next 75 years, everything that they can afford to pay under today's tax rates. And they say, hey, if there's a difference between those two numbers, you got a fiscal gap. And so what he does is he takes the net present value of that fiscal gap, uh, basically saying, what amount of money would we have to have sitting in a bank account today earning treasury rates to be able to plug that gap, to be able to deliver on all those promises. And he says the true national debt's not 24 trillion. It's not 100 trillion. It's actually much closer to 239 trillion. And that number is pre-COVID-19 stimulus spending. So I imagine that when he comes out with his number this year, his revised number, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot higher. And the, and the list goes on and on and on. We got the healthcare, welfare, so on and so forth. But if you had to pick two things on this list, two things on this list that will force uh, force debt to go higher more than any two other things, which two would you pick? Well, if you picked Medicare and Social Security, you would be 100% correct. Let's see if we can wrap our brains around why. I'm going to open up a brief parenthesis just on Social Security alone. And so I'm going to give you a little quiz on Social Security. Can anybody think of when Social Security was invented? When did they first roll out Social Security? Well, they rolled it out in 1935. And when they first started taking, uh, paying Social Security benefits, how many workers were putting money into the program for every one person that took money out? 
was 42 to one. We had 42 workers putting money in for every one person that took money out. And back then, how old did you have to be to draw on social security? Well, uh, the earliest you can draw on social security back then was age 65. Anybody want to take a stab at what the average life expectancy was in 1935? It was 62. They didn't even anticipate that the average person would live long enough to ever draw on social security. If you were lucky enough to make it to 65, how long did you draw on social security before you tipped over dead? It was just a couple of years. So in summary, when social security first started out, you had all these people putting money in, hardly anybody taking money out. And when they took it out, they took it out for two years, then they died. So was social security pretty solvent when it first started out? You bet it was set up to last forever. And then something happened. Soldiers came home from World War II and they started to do something at a rate at which they'd never done it before. what they start doing? That's right, they started to have children. In fact, if you look at demographic trends over the last 100 years or so, you basically have five generations. You start off at the turn of the century with what you call the Henry Ford generation. These are our World War II vets. What did, uh, what did Tom Brokaw call this generation? That's right, the greatest generation. And they were followed up by what we call the silent generation, still sort of reeling from the Great Depression. And then what do we call this big statistical anomaly right here in the middle? We call it the, of course, baby boomer generation. Now, as it turns out, my mom was one of the very first baby boomers. She was born January 17th, 1940. That's right, 1946. And when was the last baby boomer born? 1964. So we had 18 years of unprecedented procreation. Now, did baby boomers have uh, a few children of their own? Yeah, they had a few. And what do we call these folks? We call them Generation X. Now, I am a Generation X. Mark, I, I think you're a Generation X as well. And then we had children of our own. We call this Generation Y, which is exactly what I asked myself in the middle of the night. A little seven kid humor for you there. <laughs> uh, so as you look at this chart, the baby boomers, these folks in the middle, have nearly as many children as their parents did? The answer is no, not even close. In fact, they had 30 million fewer children. So if you were to ask yourself today, how many workers are putting money into social security for every one person that takes money out, what does that ratio look like today? It's actually much closer to three to one. And in another 10 years, what's that gonna look like? It's gonna be closer to two to one. And what's the earliest you can draw on social security today? Well, the earliest you can draw is now 62. And if you start drawing at 62, how long will you continue to draw before you tip over dead? Well, you know, a lot of times when people think about life expectancy, the number 77 or 78 pops up and that actually is average life expectancy, but that includes infant mortality and all the bad things that can happen to you up until the age 62. The truth is that if you make it to 62 and start drawing on social security, you will continue to draw on social security on average for 23 years till age 85. So social security today, just a little bit different than when it first started out. Absolutely, it started off as insurance against living too long and it slowly morphed into a pension program that covers us for nearly a quarter of our lives. Well, how many of you folks have ever heard of a guy named David Walker? David Walker. David Walker is what we call the Comptroller General of the federal government. He did that for 10 years under Bush and Clinton. He's a sort of a centrist kind of a guy, tell it like it is, uh, very good at math. Uh, he was basically the head of the Government Accountability Office. He's on the board of Social Security. He's what we call the CPA of the USA. The reason I tell you this is because David Walker knows more about these numbers than just about anyone else on the planet. And he took one look at the books and he said, hey, we have promised way more than we can afford to deliver. He says, you think Social Security is bad. He says, Medicare is five times more expensive. He said to be able to deliver on these two promises alone, let alone anything else we, we listed up there on the screen. If, in order to deliver on these two promises alone, we would have to double taxes immediately. He said that back in 2008. He says, you don't have to double taxes immediately, but for every year that you postpone, postpone doubling taxes, the national debt will grow by $2 trillion per year on average, each and every year, until we hit this magical moment in our country when we have $53 trillion of debt. So here's my question for you. What's wrong with a country that has $53 trillion of debt. Well, did you know 
that if we had $53 trillion of debt, that all of the revenue flowing into the US Treasury at that point under today's tax rates would only be enough to pay the interest on all that debt, let alone any principal, let alone a single dollar for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, or anything else we listed on the screen. David Walker was so concerned about this that in 2008, he resigned and started to crisscross the country, raising the warning cry to whoever would listen. If you were watching 60 Minutes at all during 2009, you saw David Walker a couple of different times. And in 2010, uh, David Walker wrote a book called Come Back America, in which he diagnosed the problem. And he appeared on NPR to talk about his book. And he told the radio show hostess, he said, hey, look, tax rates have to double or we're going to go broke. And she didn't believe him. So he says, look, I can give you one four letter word to explain why tax rates have to double. And she couldn't guess what it was. So they opened up the phone lines and people started to call in and nobody could figure out what the one four letter word was to explain why tax rates have to double. They heard every guess possible. They heard debt. That was the most popular guess. They heard kids, wars, jobs, fear. Uh, one guy even said health. That's not gonna work. Uh, anybody think of what that four letter word could be? Nobody ever, and I think I've had two or three people guess this, and it's probably because they read my book ahead of time. The answer is math. Math is the four letter word to explain why tax rates have to double. What does David Walker mean by math? Well, basically what he's saying, he's saying, look, if this is what you're spending and this is what's coming in, you either have to double what's coming in, cut in half what's going out, or some combination of the two. I remember I was giving the same uh, presentation two days before midterm elections in a little city called Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, back in 2009. And I remember when I was done with my presentation, everyone came up to me and they said, Dave, 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 who should we vote for? Who should we vote for? And I never felt so powerful. And I said, you know what? It doesn't matter who you vote for because whoever gets elected is going to inherit a math problem. The solution to which involves either doubling taxes, reducing spending by half or some combination of the two. All right, folks, let's get serious. How many of you guys watch cartoons? Well, I know most of you have watched cartoons at some point in your life. How many of you have ever seen The Roadrunner? Uh, every hand in the virtual classroom should be going up right now. Well, who is always trying to kill The Roadrunner? That's right, Wiley e. Coyote, super genius, right? Well, a couple of years ago, I was watching, uh, I was watching The Roadrunner. And in this particular episode, the coyote was trying to kill The Roadrunner and he was building a bomb with which to do so. And what company makes his bombs? That's right, Acme. So he's building a bomb made by Acme inside a shed that was also made by Acme. And he was so focused and intent on finishing this bomb that he didn't realize that the roadrunner had pushed his shed onto a train track. And he was so focused and intent on finishing this bomb that he also didn't realize until the last possible moment that there was a huge freight train bearing down on him. Now, very important question, most important question I'm gonna ask. Uh, during this webinar, if you found yourselves on a train track with a huge freight train bearing down on you, what would you do? Well, if you said haul yourself to safety, you'd be absolutely right. And uh, just so happens, I, I came across uh, this blurb in the USA Today. This happened a couple of years ago out in, uh, out in Utah, about, what, 11 years ago now. It says, a man from far west managed to bail out of his car that was stuck on a railroad track before the vehicle was struck by a commuter train at 55 miles per hour. Danny Olson, 62, said he took a wrong turn and got his 98 Nissan Sentra stuck between the rails Monday evening. Now, this is the important part. I want you to pay attention. When he saw the train lights approaching in his rear view mirror, ready for this, he decided to get out of the car. Good move. Great move, saved his life. Well, let's go back to the coyote. The coyote sees this huge freight train bearing down on him. And instead of jumping out of the way, what does he do? He simply pulls down the window shade, thinking that the act of doing so would make the problem go away. Did the problem go away? No, there was a huge explosion. And does the coyote ever really die? No, it's frustrating, right? But as the smoke and fire cleared away, you could sort of see him limping off screen, very much the worse for wear. Well, why did we gather here tonight to talk about the Roadrunner? Well, as Americans who do most of our saving for retirement and what we call tax deferred vehicles like 401ks and IRAs, we have a very real freight train that's bearing down on us. And it's bearing down on us in the form of what? 
Well, it's bearing down on us in the form of higher taxes, and we got a couple of choices of what we can do about it. We can pretend like the problem doesn't really exist. We can pretend like the, the, uh, the math to which David Walker referred doesn't really add up, but isn't that a little bit like pulling down the window shade? Or we can implement some strategies starting this year that can help remove us from the train tracks, thereby insulating and buffering us from the impact of higher taxes. So what we're gonna do in the balance of our time is we're gonna talk about some of those strategies that you can implement starting this year to help get yourselves off the tracks. Now, as you know, there are millions of different types of investments out there. There's all sorts of different ways that you can save money for retirement. But I'm here to tell you that no matter where you invest your dollars, all of those investments basically fit into only three types of accounts. How's that for easy? There's only three basic types of accounts within which to save money for retirement. And today we're gonna to talk about these accounts in terms of buckets of money. The first bucket we're going to talk about is what we call the taxable bucket, meaning every year as your money grows, you get to pay a tax. What are some examples of some common taxable investments? Well, these are things you've all heard of before. A savings account, CDs, money markets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. You guys get the idea. How can you tell if you have a taxable investment? Well, every year at the end of the year, uh, the financial institution sends you that little love letter. It's called a 1099. It says, hey, your money grew this much. Now you got to give a portion of that growth back to the IRS in the form of taxes. So the 1099 is the tip off. So generally speaking, the growth on the money in this bucket is 100% taxable. Well, if that's the case, why do we even have these types of investments? We have them because generally speaking, they are very liquid. That's right. What does liquid mean? Accessible. You can convert it to cash which means that it makes for great emergency funds. What do financial experts tell us about how much money we should have in emergency funds? Well, this is the one number they can actually agree upon, six months worth of basic living expenses. That said, can you have too much money in this bucket? And the answer is absolutely. We see it all the time. We see the couple who live through the depression, they shuffle into my office and they say, Dave, we got nine CDs for 100,000 each sitting in nine different banks and we think we may be paying too much in tax. Are they paying too much in tax? Absolutely, because you can have too much money in this bucket. So what's the moral of the story, folks, as it relates to this bucket? You can have too much money in this bucket from a tax efficiency perspective, but you can have not enough from an emergency fund perspective. So what we're looking for in this bucket is just the right amount. And just the right amount is six months worth of basic living expenses, second bucket. Second bucket is what we call the tax deferred bucket, meaning you don't pay tax as your money grows. When do you pay the tax? That's right, at the very end when you take the money out. So what are some examples of some common tax deferred investments? These are investments you've all heard of before. You got your IRAs, your 401ks, your 457s, your 403bs, um, you got annuities. So there's all sorts of different uh, investments that fit into this bucket. They have all sorts of different rules that apply to them, but generally speaking, they all have two things in common. The first thing they have in common, generally speaking, is when you put money in, you get a tax deduction. So for example, if you make 100,000 per year and you put 10,000 into your 401k, what's your new adjusted gross income? That's right, $90,000. The Second thing they have in common is the manner in which they're taxed upon distribution. Now, the IRS has a special word that they use to characterize this income when you take it out. What do they call this income when you take it out? Starts with an O. That's right. Ordinary income. Ordinary income. So what does that mean? That means that when you put money into your 401k, all you really did is defer the receipt of that income until some point much further down the road, and when you take the money out, at what rate are you taxed? Whatever tax rates happen to be in the year you take that money out. So folks, isn't that a little bit like going into a business partnership with the IRS? And every year the IRS gets to vote on what percentage of your profits they get to keep. Doesn't sound like a very good business partnership, huh? So you could have a million dollars in your IRA Unless you can accurately predict what tax rates are going to be in the year you take that money out, do you really know how much money you have? And the answer is no. And it's pretty hard to plan for retirement if you don't know how much money you have. Well, some people say, ah, don't worry, because you're going to be 
in a much lower uh, tax bracket in retirement than you ever were during your working years. Some of you guys have heard that before. I'm sure most of you have heard that before. The question is, is that necessarily going to be the case? Well, this much we know, even if the math to which David Walker refers doesn't really add up, and by the way, he's in the CPA Hall of Fame. Even if the math to which David Walker refers doesn't really add up, this much we know. All of the deductions that you experience during your working years literally vanish into thin air right when you need them the very most, which is when. That's right, when you're retired. So what are these, what are the typical deductions? What's the number one source of deductions for the average American? That's right, it's interest on your mortgage. Let me ask you this, is your house typically paid off by the time you reach retirement? Well, a lot of times it is. What if you're 25 years into a 30 year mortgage? Is there really all that much interest to deduct at that point? No, it's mostly going towards principal. So number one source of deductions is gone by the time you reach retirement. What's the number two source of deductions? It's your kids. And really, kids count as a tax credit. Remember, a house is a tax deduction. That's a dollar for dollar reduction in your taxable income. Well, kids count as a tax credit, and that's a dollar for dollar reduction in your tax bill. And once I figured that out, I never look back. More seven kids humor for you there. Uh, are your kids still living with you in retirement? Hopefully not, but even if they are, they're just no longer a meaningful source of tax savings. So number two source of tax savings is gone. Number three is your 401k or other qualified plan. Uh, are you still contributing to your 401k in retirement? The answer is no. The whole reason you did it is so you can take money out, not keep put, putting money in for the purpose of deductions. And then the last one we'll talk about is charity. And what we found is that if you were charitable during your working years, you're likely to continue to be charitable in retirement. Only in retirement, there's sometimes less money to go around. So instead of donating money, what do people donate? That's right. They don't donate their time. So instead of writing that uh, writing that check out to the soup kitchen, you may actually walk down to the soup kitchen and ladle the soup yourself, which is incredibly noble and worthwhile. But what does the IRS think about your time? They don't think about it at all. It doesn't even show up on their radar because time is not a deductible activity. So guess what? All of these deductions during your working years may have added up to 60, 70, in some cases, $80,000 of deductions. Well, absent any of these deductions in retirement, what deduction do you have left? Starts with an S. That's right, it's a standard deduction, which if you retire today as a married couple is $24,800. 60, 70, in some cases 80,000 during your working years, but 24, eight in retirement. If you needed $120,000 to live in retirement and you only had $24,800 of deductions, what's your taxable income? That's right, it's 95 two. Uh, you wanna take a stab at what federal marginal tax bracket that puts you in? 22%. Throw in another 6% for state. Now we're talking 28% on the margin. That's a lot higher than most people think. I remember I was uh, listening to a radio show a couple of years ago. A lady calls in. She says, I don't understand. I'm making less money in retirement, but I'm paying more in taxes. How is that possible? And the radio show host said, well, tell me about your deductions. And she says, deductions? I ran out of those a long time ago. And he says, oh, I think I understand your problem. So... Will we necessarily be in a lower tax bracket in retirement? Not necessarily. Now, how many of you guys have read a book called Catch-22? Maybe it was required reading for you in high school. Well, if, if you read Catch-22, you may remember the name of the main character. It starts with a Y. His name was Yosarian. Now, Yosarian was on a bombing mission uh, or on a bombing squad in World War II, and all of his buddies were also on bombing squads. And you notice this very disturbing trend. All of his buddies would fly, fly into battle. One by one, they get shot down and they wouldn't come back. So he realized that if he kept on going on these bombing missions sooner or later, he was going to be one of those guys that flew in the battle and didn't come back. So he had to try to figure out a way to get out of this. So he starts to research the Air Force rules and regulations and he comes across rule number, that's right, rule number 22. And rule number 22 says, if you can plead insanity, you can be honorably discharged from the Air Force. So that's what he decides to do. So he goes up to a superior officer. He says, you know what? I can't do this job anymore because I'm going crazy. And what does the guy say? He says, there's no way you could be going crazy because this is the perfect job for crazy people. And the fact that you're trying to get out of it is actually proof that you're perfectly sane. 
So keep on going on those bombing missions. And that's exactly what he had to do. Well, why do I tell you this story? Do we still use the phrase catch 22 today? Absolutely. Stuck between a rock and a hard place. Darned if you do, darned if you don't. Well, the reason I tell you this is because anything in this tax deferred bucket is the perfect modern day example of what we call a catch 22. Here's why. You got to remember that the IRS wants to tax you on this money so badly that at a certain point in time, they will force you to take the money out. What age is that? That's right. It's age 72. And what do they call it? They call it required minimum distributions or RMDs. And what happens if you choose not to or forget to take the money out? That's right. You get a penalty. It's actually called an excise tax and it's 50%. So let's say you're supposed to take out $10,000, chose not to, forgot to, you will get a bill in the mail for $5,000. Now, does that include state and federal income tax? No. Throw in another 30% on the margin and you just lost 80% of what you're supposed to take out, but did not. Is the IRS pretty serious about getting their money? Absolutely. So that's the rock. That's what happens if you don't take enough money out. Well, if that's the rock, what's the hard place? Well, the hard place is what happens if you take out too much money. What happens, by the way, if you take out too much money? Well, uh, first of all, you start bumping up into a higher and higher tax bracket, which means you spend your money down faster, which means you run out faster, but there's one other thing the IRS keeps track of something called provisional income. Now, if you haven't heard of provisional income, don't feel badly. Um, by the way, provisional income is the income the IRS keeps track of uh, to determine if they're going to tax your social security. I remember I was giving this uh, talk to 100 CPAs uh, um, a couple of years ago. I said, how many guys have heard of provisional income? How many hands do you think in the room went up? Only two, which is scary because provisional income is a really big deal. It's the income the IRS keeps track of to determine whether they're going to tax your social security. What counts as provisional income? Well, any 1099s from your taxable bucket count as provisional income, any distributions at all from your tax deferred bucket count as provisional income, and one half of your social security count as provisional income. Now the IRS adds all this provisional income up and if it's a single person, it adds up to more than 34,000, or if it's a married couple, it adds up to more than 44,000, uh, then up to 85% of your social security uh, can become taxable to you at your highest marginal tax bracket. Uh, well, let me see if I can put that into perspective for you. I want you to think back to your chemistry class and that long skinny cylinder with the red lines on it. What do we call that? That's right. It's a graduated cylinder. Um, the reason I tell you that is because our tax system in our country works <clears throat> exactly like a graduated cylinder. Your money flows in, goes all the way down to the bottom. Some of your money gets taxed at 10, some at 12, some at 22, some at 24, some at tw uh, 32, some at 35, and some at 37. So to give you an idea on this, even Bill Gates has some of his earned income taxed at only 10%. If for only about three seconds, right? And then he moves rapidly to the top and most of his earned income gets taxed at 37. So let's say that because of your distributions from this bucket, you're in the 22% tax bracket. Let's also say that you're planning on getting $25,000 of social security. Well, the IRS is going to say, hey, before we let you keep all this social security, we got to do one additional calculation. Because you took so much money out of your tax deferred bucket, and because you far exceeded those uh, provisional income thresholds, we're now going to take 85% of that 25,000 or about 21,000, and we're going to stuff it into your cylinder and it's gonna land right on top of all your other income, at which point you get to pay tax of 22% on 21,000. What's 22% of 21,000? 4,620. So guess what, folks? Because you took too much money out of your tax deferred bucket in retirement, you now have a $4,620 hole in your social security. How do you think most Americans go about plugging that hole? That's right taking more money out of their 401ks and IRAs. So here's a math question for you. If tax rates went up to 50%, like David Walker's predicting, how much money would you have to take out of your IRA to be able to pay the 50% tax of the IRS and then be left over with $4,620 with which you could then plug the hole in your social security? That's right, what's double 4,620? It's $9,240, folks. Why do I even bring this stuff up? I bring it up because I've done the math a hundred times in a hundred different ways on a hundred different clients. And this is what I've concluded. I have concluded that when your social security gets taxed, you run out of money five to seven years faster than people who do not have their social security taxed. Why? 
because the act of compensating for social security taxation forces you to spend down all your other assets that much faster. All right, everybody pretty much in a good mood by now? Well, let's talk about a third bucket. A third bucket has all sorts of different names. Some people call it tax advanced, some call it tax referred, uh, some call it tax exempt me. I like to call it tax free. Now I gotta warn you, there's all sorts of different investments out there that masquerade as tax free, but I'm here to tell you to be truly tax free. It's gotta qualify in two different ways. First way is it's gotta really be tax free. And when I say tax free, I'm talking free from three different types of taxes, free from federal tax, free from state tax, and free from capital gains tax. How many of you guys have heard of municipal bonds? Well, are municipal bonds truly tax-free? Well, let's take a look at it. Are they free from federal tax? The answer is yes, they are free from federal tax. Are they free from state tax? Well, the answer to that is it depends. Let's say I live in Wisconsin. I want to buy a municipal bond from Illinois. Uh, don't know why I would. I don't know if you guys heard, true story, the, uh, this guy from Illinois won the lottery and they actually, they had to write him an IOU. It's a true story. Um, that sort of bespeaks the uh, financial condition of a lot of states in the country, actually. Um, but if I were in Illinois and I bought a municipal bond from the state of Illinois, would the state of Wisconsin give me a tax break for that? And the answer is no, I'm not benefiting the municipality in which I live. And let's say I don't want to, um, let's say I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. So I buy a mutual fund of municipal bonds and that mutual fund appreciates in value and I sell it at a gain. Will I pay capital gains tax? And the answer is yes. Uh, so an investment that we've been told for years and years and years is tax-free uh, doesn't qualify in two of the three scenarios here. The second thing I'm looking for in a true tax-free investment is no social security taxation. In other words, when you take distributions from a true tax-free investment, it should not count as provisional income. It should not count against the thresholds which cause social security taxation. By the way, when you take interest off your Municipal bonds, does that count as provisional income? And the answer is it absolutely does. So like I told you, an investment that we've been told for years and years and years is double tax-free, triple tax-free, doesn't, doesn't meet either of our basic litmus tests. Well, now that we know that this bucket at least exists, what we're gonna do in the balance of our time is I'm simply going to give you an example. I'm simply gonna give you a scenario. Now, the one thing I can guarantee is that this scenario is not going to fit anybody in this room perfectly, anybody in this virtual room perfectly. Uh, but the one thing I can guarantee is that there will be something in this example that does apply specifically to your situation. So I want you to watch out for it. So the example I'm gonna give you is Mr. and Mrs. Jones, they're 50 years old, between the two of them, they make 100,000 per year and they wanna retire at 65. Now remember, we got the three buckets up here. Anybody remember the names of the three buckets? That's right, taxable, tax deferred, and tax free. Now, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones have $500,000 in their cumulative IRAs. They've got $100,000 in their plain old taxable mutual funds. That's their emergency fund. They're putting 10% into their 401k. They're getting no match, no free money. And they're putting $2,000 per year, paying $2,000 per year for some term life insurance and $4,000 per year for some long-term care insurance. Well, um, if someone like this were to walk into a traditional tax deferred uh, paradigm financial advisor's office, how would the conversation go? Well, it just so happens I've been training traditional uh, tax deferred financial advisors for the last 15 years of my life. And in the act of doing so, I have sat in their offices and I've listened to them as they've spoken to people like this for the very first time. And here's how the conversation goes. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, congratulations. They always congratulate you. Uh, you've done a great job saving money in this IRA. The problem is last year down the road at XYZ Company, you only earned 7%. We think we can get you eight. So roll all that money over to us. Uh, as far as your mutual funds go, that's a great emergency fund. Problem is last year down the road, you only earned 3%. We think we can get you five, so man, let us manage that for you as well. As far as your 401k with no match goes, keep on doing it. When you switch jobs, give us a call. We'll roll the 401k into the IRA, get everything under one roof, maybe save you some breakpoints, save you some fees. And as far as your term life insurance and long-term care insurance goes, gosh, you know, not really what we do, but who are we to say you shouldn't keep doing it? And that is a conversation that I've heard literally dozens and dozens of times. Well, when someone like this walks into my office for their very first time, I see red flags all over the place. For example, I'm not so much concerned with what's in this IRA today. What keeps me awake at night is what this IRA is gonna be worth 15 years from now if it grows at 8% per year. So what would you suppose that 500,000 would be worth 15 years from now if it grew at 8% per year? That's right, $1.6 million. 
Now, you may be thinking, well, that's great. Who wouldn't want to have $1.6 million in their IRA? Problem is, um, what are the repercussions of having $1.6 million in your tax deferred bucket? Um, required minimum distributions alone on 1.6 million is going to put you in one of the higher marginal federal tax brackets and literally guarantee that your social security will be taxed in perpetuity. So what we want to do, forcing you to you know, spend down all your other assets to compensate. So what we want to do is we want to prevent that IRA from ever growing to 1.6 million. I don't want to stop it growing altogether. I just don't want to grow it in that bucket. So here's my question for you. How do you prevent an IRA from growing? And don't anyone say, put it in the stock market. A little stock market humor for you. Uh, one thing that people might recommend at this point is to do what we call a Roth conversion. Now, Roth conversion simply says that if you have money in your tax deferred bucket in the form of an IRA, you can shift it to tax free so long as you pay what along the way? Taxes. At what rate? Whatever the rate happens to be in the year you make the shift. Uh, so let's say that Mr. and Mrs. Jones here convert the entire IRA all in one year. Uh, they pay 40% tax. How much tax are they going to owe on that $500,000 conversion? They're going to owe $200,000. Now, let me ask you this. Do Mr. and Mrs. Jones have $200,000 just lying around that they could happily earmark for that tax bill? And the answer is no, they don't have that money lying around. So some people say, that's okay, Dave. They don't need to have that money lying around because they can have the IRS withhold it from the Roth conversion itself. In other words, pay it right out of the $500,000 conversion itself. Well, what would happen if they did that as a couple of 50 year olds? They would get a 10% penalty. The IRS says, even if you take the money out and you give it right back to the IRS in the form of a tax, if you're younger than 59 and a half, when you do so, they will give you a 10% penalty. So unless you have a lot of money just languishing in your taxable bucket that you could happily earmark towards a tax on that Roth, Roth conversion, I would probably wait until 59 and a half before you did any Roth conversions. So the question becomes, are there any other ways to get money out of those IRAs pre 59 and a half without penalty? Well, at this point, I'd bring up that little known section of the IRS tax code at section 72, subsection T in our industry, we call it a 72 T. And a 72T says that you can take money out of your IRA pre 59 and a half without penalty, so long as you do it in separate equal yearly distributions that last for at least five years or until 59 and a half, whichever is longer. These days, uh, by way of 72T, you can take out about 5% per year. So 5% of 500,000 is? $25,000 and they can shift that to tax free. By the way, if they want to, they can pay the tax on that 72T right out of the 25,000 itself, no problem. All right, let's take a look at these mutual funds. How do we feel about these mutual funds? Do they have, if this is their emergency fund, do they have too much or too little in that emergency fund? Well, if they make 100,000 per year, they got too much. Uh, they they much rather have closer to $50,000. So not only do they have too much in this emergency fund, uh, but they're growing in mutual funds, which means the problem's getting bigger every year. So what we want to do is we want to take the growth on that mutual funds plus some of the principal, and we want to reposition it to tax-free. We want to shift it from taxable to tax-free little by little, year by year, such that by, by the time they reach 65, they've got the perfect amount, which is 50,000. I've done the math on this, folks. That would require an annual shift of $6,000 per year. Okay, how do we feel about 401ks that don't have matches? Well, this is the one thing that Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, and Clark Howard actually agree upon. The rule of thumb when it comes to 401ks is you put in up to the match, but not one penny above and beyond. You do whatever's required to get the free money, and then you move on to the next best thing. Well, if these folks are trying to prevent their IRA from growing by doing a 72T, yet they're putting money hand over fist into their 401k and they're getting no free money, are those two strategies at odds with each other? And the answer is yes. So we want to recapture that 10% shifted to tax-free. 10% of 100,000 is $10,000. How do we feel about term life insurance and long-term care insurance? We feel like it's incredibly important to mitigate both of these risks, either one of which can really upset your financial apple cart. But we feel like sometimes, not always, sometimes there can be a better way to accomplish that. So we may recapture that $6,000 as well. So how much total money did we free up on an annual basis to be able to reposition to tax-free? Try $47,000. Well, usually at this point, someone will say, hey, Dave, not so fast. You don't really have 
$47,000 freed up. And I'll say, why not? And they'll say, because some of those recommendations that you made are actually taxable events. Are they right? Yeah, they are. In fact, that 72T is a taxable event. And when you put less money into your 401k, that increases your taxable income. So that's a taxable event as well. So because of the strategy, we realized $35,000 of additional taxable income. Uh, tax on the margin, let's call it 30%. That's $10,500 of additional taxation every year that we implement this strategy. So here's my question for you. Do Mr. and Mrs. Jones have $10,500 just lying around that they would love to earmark for this tax bill? Not that they would love. And if we say, quit going out to eat, quit going on vacation, pull back the belt a couple of notches just so you can pay that tax bill, will they return my phone calls? And the answer is no. So we got to find a way to help them pay that tax bill such that we are not encroaching on their lifestyle. So what we may recommend is that they simply pay that tax right out of the 47,000 that we just freed up, which means they really have $10,500, pardon me, which means they really have $36,500 uh, that they can reposition a tax-free every year. So folks, this is where the rubber hits the road. Where can we position uh, $36,500 per year such that it grows in a truly tax-free way. Well, at this point, I may recommend one of my very favorite tax-free investments, and that's what we call a Roth IRA. I'm sure many of you have heard of a Roth IRA. How much money can two 50-year-olds put into Roth IRAs these days? 7,000 each for a total of $14,000. Why do I like Roth IRAs so much? I like Roth IRAs so much because Roth IRAs are truly tax-free. So long as you're 59 and a half when you take the money out, you don't pay any of those taxes we talked about, and when you take money out of your Roth IRA, it does not count as provisional income, does not count against the thresholds, which cause social security taxation. Roth IRAs are truly tax-free. By the way, when I say Roth IRAs, I'm talking any investment with the word Roth in front of it. It could be a Roth IRA, it could be a Roth 401k, it could be a Roth conversion. They are all truly tax-free. <clears throat> So we take 14,000 from the 36.5 and we fund uh, our Roth IRAs. That leaves us with $22,500 per year. Where can we put $22,500 per year such that it grows in a truly tax-free way? Well, at this point, I may bring up a uh, little known bucket of money. Uh, what happens with this bucket is you put money, you put money into this bucket. As this money grows, your bucket begins to fill. Only the IRS says that the growth on the money in this bucket is going to be treated under a different section of the IRS tax code than anything else we've talked about so far. What does that section of the IRS tax code say? It says that you can take money out of this bucket pre 59 and a half without penalty. Can you do that in your IRA or 401k? And the answer is no. They're gonna tell you that as your money grows, you receive no 1099s. What does that mean? That's right, no tax as it grows. And they're also gonna tell you that when you take the money out, if you take it out the right way, you can take it out tax-free. It is not going to show up as reportable income on your tax return. They're also gonna tell you that it does not count as provisional income. They're also gonna tell you that there are no contribution limits. What did we say were the contribution limits for the Roth IRA? That's right, 7,000 each if you're over age 50 for a total of 14,000 per year. Folks, I've got clients that do $50 a month and I've got clients that do 200,000 per year and everywhere in between. There are no limits on how much you put into this bucket. They're also gonna tell you that there are no income limitations. Uh, let me ask you this, can Bill Gates do a Roth IRA? The answer is no, why not? Well, um, he makes too much money. You start making north of $206,000 of uh, modified adjusted gross income, you can no longer do a Roth IRA. Can my children, the youngest of whom is five, do Roth IRAs? And the answer is no. In order to do Roth IRAs, you have to have earned income. My kids work, I just don't pay them. Uh, and the last one, uh, let me do one more example there. Uh, let's say you're retired, drawing money from uh, social security, a pension, taking RMDs from your IRAs. Can you do a Roth IRA? And the answer is no. You gotta be working somewhere earning the paycheck. Can you do a Roth conversion? Yes, no income limitations on that, but you cannot do a Roth IRA. None of, those, uh, none of those provisions apply to this particular bucket. And they're also gonna tell you that if history serves as a model, there may be no legislative risk. Well, what do you think I mean by no legislative risk? Well, let me give you an example. I've got a client in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. In 1963, he signed up for the Wisconsin State Teacher Pension Plan. And one of the inducements was they said, hey, if you sign up for this plan, we will give you your pension and retirement state tax 
free. Well, he says, that sounds great, I'm in. So he signs up, well, guess what? The very next year, 1964, they changed the rules. They said, now we will charge you, uh, we will charge tax on these programs in retirement. Well, fast forward 30 years, and he gets his first Wisconsin state teacher pension check. Do they take out state tax? The answer is no, they do not. What do we call that kind of a clause? We call it a grandfather clause. Well, guess what? They changed the rules in this bucket three different times in 82, 84, and 88. And every single time they changed the rule, they simply said, whoever has the bucket before the rules change, get to keep it and continue to put money into it under the old rule for the rest of their lives. We call that a grandfather clause. Well, usually right about now people say, well, gosh, Dave, this is like the alignment of the stars. This is like the perfect investment. Why not just put all my money into this bucket? Well, first of all, is it ever a good idea to put all your eggs into any one basket? And the answer is no. Not only that, but the IRS says, if we're gonna give you the benefit of an unlimited bucket of tax-free dollars, we're gonna require that there be a cost of admission. We're gonna require that there be a spigot attached to the side of that bucket through which flows on a monthly basis some expenses. And what do those expenses go towards? Well, they go towards some administrative fees, but they primarily go towards the cost of term life insurance, term life insurance. Well, let me ask you this. If your uh, house is paid off, your kids have moved out and you're rapidly approaching retirement, is term life insurance really all that high on your wish list? And the answer is no. It's usually right about now that people start dumping their term life insurance and the companies that sponsor these programs recognize that. So they've done something to sweeten the pot. They simply say that in the event that somewhere down the road you should need long-term care they will give you your death benefit while you're alive for the purpose of paying for it. Let me give an example. Let's say you got a death benefit of 400,000. You wake up one day, you can no longer feed yourself, bathe yourself, transfer yourself, what have you, any two of six activities of daily living. You can find one doctor to write one letter to that effect. They will start sending you 25% of that death benefit or 100,000 per year, every year for four years for the purpose of paying for long-term care. Now, they may discount that number slightly based on your age and when you receive the benefit, but the point is this. They're willing to give you your death benefit while you're alive for the purpose of paying for long-term care. Let me ask you this. How many of you guys have looked into traditional long-term care insurance? Is it cheap? No. It's getting more and more expensive all the time. Can it be hard to qualify? Yes. You might live to be 120, but if you have a bad elbow, a bad knee, a bad back, you may not even get accepted. And what happens if you pay, 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 pay? for 30 years and die peaceful in your sleep, never having used it, do they send you all your money back at the end? And the answer is no. It goes to pay for someone else's benefit. And that can be a source of heartburn for a lot of different people because nobody wants to pay for something that they hope they never have to use. Why is this different? This is different because if you die peaceful in your sleep 30 years from now, never having needed uh, the long-term care, guess what? Someone's still getting a death benefit. So there isn't that sensation of having paid for something you hope you never have to use. By the way, have Mr. and Mrs. Jones already bought off on the idea that they need term insurance and long-term care? The answer is yes, they've already budgeted for it, $6,000 per year. All we're suggesting is that maybe, instead of sending that money off to an insurance company in the form of a premium payment, why not recapture it, dump it into their bucket, let a portion of it drip out in the form of expenses, and now take advantage of a huge bucket of tax-free dollars that wasn't previously available to you. By the way, what do we call this bucket? It's chapter five of my book, The Power of Zero. We call it the L-I-R-P. What does that stand for? It stands for Life Insurance Retirement Plan. Why life insurance? Because the IRS says in order for this bucket to work, you gotta be willing to pay for some term insurance. Uh, you gotta have a need for life insurance. Why retirement plan? Because one of the ancillary goals of this bucket is to build money up so that somewhere down the road, you can take money out and spend it on your lifestyle at a period in time when tax rates are likely to be much higher than they are today. All right, before we go any further, I got this question to ask, and it's a very important question. It's at the heart of everything we're talking about tonight. If you could be in any tax bracket, any tax bracket of your choosing in retirement, which tax bracket would you choose? And if you said zero, you would be absolutely correct. Well, if what Mr. and Mrs. Jones if, if, if what Mr. and Mrs. Jones want to do is be in the 0% tax bracket, tell me how they're doing so far. <clears throat> they're going to have money coming out of their Roth IRA, so long as they're 59 and a half when they take the money out. Will they pay tax? No tax. 
uh, they're going to have a lot of money coming out of their LIRP. And regardless of how old they are when they take the money out, will they pay tax? And the answer is no tax. Now, let's go back to that IRA. Remember that IRA? Our goal in doing the 72T was simply to prevent that IRA from getting any bigger. If we did a good job of preventing that IRA from getting any bigger, how much money should we still have in that, should they still have in that IRA by the time they reach 65? That's right, $500,000. So here's my question for you. If at age 65, Mr. and Mrs. Jones have $500,000 in that IRA, is there any way for them to take money out of that IRA, spend it on their lifestyle, not pay tax, and it's gotta be legal? Well, actually, there is a way. Now, remember what we said. If you retire today, absent any other deductions, the IRS gives you a deduction. What do we call that? We call that a standard deduction, which if you retire today as a married couple would be $24,800. Does the IRS index that number to keep up with inflation? The answer is yes. Historically, they have by about 3% per year. So by the time Mr. and Mrs. Jones here reach 65, they're going to have much closer to $38,800 of deductions. So the question becomes, if, in, if at age 65, they have $38,800 of deductions, how much could they take out of that IRA and not pay any tax at all? The answer is $38,800. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is as long as you only take out up to whatever your standard deduction happens to be in any given year, you now have a, an IRA that's 100% tax-free. By the way, if we had let that IRA grow to 1.6 million, would required minimum distributions alone on 1.6 million have been greater than uh, $38,800? And the answer is yes. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is when you let your IRA grow or your 401k grow in an unbridled sort of a way, you can close the door of possibility to ever being in the 0% tax bracket. You can open the door of possibility to being exposed to a dramatic rise in tax rates over time. By the way, if we have no tax, no tax, no tax, and we can stay below our provisional income thresholds, what do you suppose happens to their social security? The answer is no tax. If we have no tax, no tax, no tax, no tax, what tax bracket does that put them in? The answer is zero. Now, why do we make such a big deal about being in the 0% tax bracket? Well, if we can't get you to the 0% tax bracket, what's the next best tax bracket? And don't anyone say one? The answer is 10, that's right. Uh, throw in another 6% for state and now we're talking 16. And if what David Walker says comes true and tax rates have to double to keep our country solvent, what happens to 16? That's right, 32. All of a sudden, second place isn't looking all that great. Now, I love it when things make sense conceptually, but I love it even more when they make sense mathematically. So what I did for these folks is what we call a before and after. And I know you guys have seen the, the diet photos before and then after. Well, guess what? You can do the exact same thing with your retirement projections. You can do a before and after comparison. So that's exactly what we did for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And basically what we said is, look, had they never met us and kept on doing exactly what they're doing and had taxes stayed at 30% for the rest of their lives, how much money would they have been, been able to spend uh, had their assets grown at six and a half percent per year over that time frame? Well, according to my math, just shy of $4.5 million. I know what you're thinking. That sounds like a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money. The problem is they run out of money at age 85, uh, at which point they can either die or move in with their kids. Conversely, if they do everything that we talked about, uh, they can spend almost $8 million. Now, they never run out of money. At age 100, they still have 1.4 million left over. Now, you may be thinking, Dave, why such a big difference? Well, here's the reason why there's such a big difference. When you make little tiny changes at the beginning of your retirement, or at age 50 in this case, and you amortize those, amortize those tiny changes out over a lifetime, there is a massive quantum difference on the back end. More importantly, what happens to the gray column if tax rates double? Does it get bigger or smaller? It gets smaller. What happens to the blue column if tax rates double? It stays exactly the same. Why? Because if you're in the 0% tax bracket and tax rates double, what's two times zero? The answer is zero. So that's what we call the power of zero. Why? Because if you're in the 0% tax bracket and tax rates double, two times zero is still zero. Now, uh, usually at this point, we get a couple of different questions. The first question, this is far and away the number one question that I get, and it's this, 
uh, am I too old to get to the 0% tax bracket? And I usually respond to that question in the following way. Uh, throughout 2018, uh, filmmaker Doug Orchard and I barnstormed across the country interviewing all of the top experts in the nation about uh, the, the national debt and the, or the future national debt and the impact it would have on future tax rates. Um, we met with George Schultz. We met, met with David Walker, Larry Kotlikoff, the governor of Utah. Uh, take a listen to what they had to say. Mark, do you have that? Yes, I do. I'm pulling it up right now. Tell me if you see my... I can see it. Okay. I'll hit it. The truth is the federal government has lost control of the budget. Instead of paying for all the new initiatives, whether they're tax cuts, spending increases, all sorts of things that we like, the government's just putting it all on the national credit card. And as a result, our national debt is just going up and up and up. And it's growing faster than the economy. And that's when you know you have a real problem. Everything is going to be squeezed out of the budget. There won't be anything left. The road we are on is a perilous one that ultimately leads to the bankrupting of our country. So we have a crisis on our hands. All Congress has to do for this whole situation to come to a head is nothing. Because every year that they do nothing makes the problem even more unsolvable. We don't seem to have the ability to get along and, and find common ground. Is the government trying to trick you right now? And the answer is very simply yes. So why is this being swept under the rug? Why is nobody talking about this? Probably because it's not popular. So I've actually been traveling around the country for about four years now, taking the power of zero message to different groups. When you cut taxes on current generations, you are simultaneously raising them on future generations. It is all driven by spending. Once we have spent a dollar, We've already decided to tax it. The only question is whether we tax it now or we borrow it now and tax it uh, in the future. So to make up for the liabilities that we're incurring with all the promises we've made in social insurance programs, we're gonna have to increase substantially the tax rate and perhaps even double it. Now precisely how high it's gonna be, you know, there's a lot of room to debate, but people will have to pay more taxes. People's retirement savings are at risk of future higher taxes. Well, qualified plans really do two things. They defer the tax and the tax calculation. Now let that run past your brain real slow. I'm driven by trying to help as many people as I can avoid this disaster that's going to come up in retirement when taxes go up and the market goes down. What are these people going to do if they haven't planned ahead of time? Okay, David, you can take the screen back. All right. So uh, thank you, Mark. So um, all of these experts are reading the same music and they're all singing the same song. And they're simply saying that if we don't shift course in a dramatic way, the tax rates, even 10 years from now, are going to have to be dramatically higher just to keep our country solvent. In fact, some of these experts use the D word as it relates to the future of tax rates. What's the D word? Tax rates will have to double uh, to keep our country solvent. So the real question is not, are you too old to do this? The real question should be, if 2030 rolls around and tax rates double, will you look back on the year 2030 and say, or so, sorry, back on the year 2020 and say, why did I not take advantage of tax rates while they were historically low? Because all tax rates have to do in the future is go up by 1% for the math here to make sense. So the real question you should be asking yourself is, will you be alive in 2030? The second question I get is, all right, I might have to click on this. There we go. Second question is, can you be in the 0% tax bracket and still be a good person? Well, first of all, are we suggesting that Mr. and Mrs. Jones in this example not pay tax? No. The cost of getting to the 0% tax bracket is you got to be willing to pay a tax. We're simply suggesting that when given the choice between paying taxes at today's historically low tax rates or postponing the payment of those taxes till some point much further down the road, that you're probably better off paying them today. 
Plus, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a guy named Judge Learned Hand. He's the most famous judge to never become a Supreme Court justice. This is what he had to say about it. He said, anyone may arrange his affairs so that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He's not bound to choose that pattern, which best pays a treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. Over and over again, the courts have said there's nothing sinister and so arranging affairs as to keep taxes as low as possible. Everyone does it, rich and poor alike, and all do right, for nobody owes any public duty to pay more than the law demands. So can you be in the 0% tax bracket and still be a good person? The answer is yes. The third question is, hey, Dave, <clears throat> how come I've never heard of this stuff before? Well, I would submit that you guys have heard of just about everything we've talked about tonight, maybe not quite in this combination. Um, the only thing uh, that, that may be new for some people is this idea of the LIRP. And really, all we're doing with the LIRP is the opposite of what most people do when it comes to life insurance. What do most people do when it comes to life insurance? They get as much death benefit as they can for as little money as possible. Here, we're doing just the opposite. We're getting as little money as we can. So are we buying as little death benefit as the IRS requires of us? And we're stuffing as much money into it as the IRS allows in an attempt to mimic all of the tax-free benefits of the Roth IRA without any of the limitations. Well, why else haven't you heard about this? Well, you gotta ask yourself how most major money management institutions make money. How do most major money management institutions make money? They charge you a fee. What's a typical fee they might charge you? Well, uh, it's about 1%. So let's say they're managing a million of your dollars and they're charging you 1%. How much are they making off you per year? Well, we'll call it $10,000. Uh, if they were to persuade you the tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today, then you might just feel impressed to shift that money to tax-free. And if you shift it to tax-free, what are you gonna have to pay along the way? That's right, you're gonna have to pay a tax, let's call it 30%. So you pay 30% tax on that million, you now have $700,000 in that tax-free bucket. If they're still charging you 1%, how much are they making off you per year now? Only $7,000. Well, didn't they just experience a pay cut for persuading you the tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. And for that reason alone, most major money management institutions don't wanna to touch this conversation with a 10 foot pole. Me personally, I don't care how much money you have. The only thing that matters to me is how much you actually get to spend after tax. That's the only number that really matters. So for those of you who are taking notes, I got a couple of different takeaways for you. Takeaway number one, Matt, uh, Tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. Folks, we are sort of past the point of no return on this, especially because of the uh, CARES Act, uh, COVID-19 stimulus spending. Uh, we, you know, that train has really left the station here. There is no way to go backwards in time and avoid an increase in taxes, even 10 years from now. The tax rates, uh, most experts agree, will be, will be dramatically higher 10 years from now than they are today. Uh, takeaway number two, the only way to truly insulate yourself from the impact of higher taxes is to get to the 0% tax bracket. Why? Because if you're in the 0% tax bracket and tax rates double, what's two times zero? That's right, zero. The third question is this, uh, you know, um, I've, I've over the last 22 years, I've helped put thousands of people uh, on the road to the 0% tax bracket. I noticed something very interesting. It is nearly impossible to get to the 0% tax bracket by relying on just one stream of tax-free income. For example, it's nearly impossible to get to the 0% tax bracket by relying on, on just the traditional Roth IRA. It's nearly impossible to get to the 0% tax bracket by relying, for example, on the LIRP. To get to the 0% tax bracket typically requires between four and six different streams of tax-free income, none of which show up on the IRS's radar, but all of which contribute to you being in the 0% tax bracket. Uh, takeaway number four, uh, you know, it used to be that when, when people would say, hey, Dave, when are tax rates going up? I'd say, well, you know, in some distant, unknowable future, maybe 10 years from now, tax rates are likely to be higher than they are today. Well, guess what? We now know the year and the day when tax rates will go up. January 1st, 2026. That's when the uh, Tax Cup and Job Acts expires. It goes into sunset, January 1st, 2026. And every year between now and then represents a little mini window of opportunity during which to take advantage of historically low tax rates. And every year that goes by where you, where you fail to take advantage of historically low tax rates is potentially a year beyond 2026 when you could be forced to pay the highest tax rates you're likely to see in your lifetime. Takeaway number five. 
You know, I talk about in chapter six of my book, The Power of Zero, the tax sale of a lifetime. Well, guess what? We got another sale that's going on right now, and that's the stock market. Uh, remember, the cost of getting into the 0% tax bracket is you got to be willing to pay a tax. Would you rather pay tax on a million dollars or would you rather pay tax on $750,000? Guess what? Why not pay tax on some of those dollars in your tax deferred bucket while the stock market is down? And then once that money gets into the tax-free bucket, let those assets recover in a tax-free environment. So you've got two sales going on right now. You've got the, the sale on taxes and you got the sale on the stock market. I will submit to you that right now is the very best time in the history of our country to take advantage of these concepts simply because the cost of getting to the 0% tax bracket has never, ever been this low. Takeaway number six, all this is great news. Well, Dave, what do you mean? Well, I, I had a lady come up to me at the end of one of my workshops a couple months back and she says, Dave, I'm, uh, now I'm in a really bad mood. And I said, well, why would you be in such a bad mood? And she says, because I got all my money in the tax deferred bucket. And I said, let me see if I got this right. You contributed money to your tax deferred bucket at a period in time when tax rates were likely much higher than they are today and you got a deduction at those higher tax rates for doing so, you now have a six year period of time during which to take advantage of historically low tax rates so you can get those tax deferred assets systematically shifted to tax free. And once they're in the tax free bucket and tax rates go up for good, you can then take those assets out and never pay tax on them ever again. I said, is that why you're in such a bad mood? She says, well, gosh, Dave, I never really thought about it that way. So folks, how is this story going to end for you? Well, I would submit that so long as you take advantage of the next six years of historically low tax rates before they go up for good and before they potentially double over time, then you get to control how much of your hard earned assets that you get to spend. So that's the good news. Now, um, I've been working with, with Mark for quite a long time. He works very closely with our office and, and Mark's, uh, Mark's a great friend. Um, one of the things that Mark is going to do for you is he is going to do a before and after comparison. Only his before and after comparison is going to be a little bit different than the one that we talked about uh, today during the, uh, during the webinar because his is going to have three different projections. The first projection says that if you keep on doing exactly what you're doing and uh, tax rates stay about where they are for the rest of their lives and you don't change anything about your plan, um, how much money will you be able to spend after tax? He will show you uh, how much money you'll be able to spend after tax and he'll show you the year in which your money is likely to run out. And then he's going to run a second comparison that says, if you keep on doing exactly what you're doing and tax rates double, how much sooner will your money run out? And guess what, folks, if your money runs out, um, actually, I can give you a plot spoiler on this. Uh, if tax rates double, your money typically runs out 12 to 15 years faster. Uh, and then he's going to run a third comparison that simply says this, that if you implement all of the recommendations that he suggests that you implement, um, and uh, you can get uh, at or near the 0% tax bracket, get your social security, then uh, tax free, uh, how much longer will your money last? And guess what, folks, if your money lasts five to seven years longer, you spend an extra million and a half dollars in the process, I think at that point, it's probably worth looking into. Now, let me tell you one of the reasons why I did this webinar with, with Mark tonight. I did this webinar with Mark because he's one of the uh, top three power of zero advisors in the nation. And I don't say that lightly. Um, we've got about 250 advisors all across the country in our network. And Mark is right there at the very top. So you are, uh, you've got a great opportunity to work with Mark. Um, he is a power of zero expert. Um, he has been doing this for years. He's helped hundreds of people get on the road to the 0% tax bracket. And he is a, a, a really a top expert in the field. And, and that is really um, the primary reason why I agreed to come on this webinar with him because I've enjoyed uh, my relationship with Mark and he really does it the right way. So uh, that said, Mark, I will, uh, I appreciate you having me on tonight and I'll pass it back to you. Uh, Dave, thanks so much. And thanks for your kind words. I'm very humbled. I have to tell you, you know, I've given that presentation um, as the final exam that uh, for the course that you put together so many times, but I love hearing you do it. Uh, there's nobody who does it better. So thank you very much. Um, 
And I'm sure that my students, my past students have been in the class have said, you know, I've kind of heard this before, but boy, doesn't it sound better right now. <laughs> so um, I want to, I just want to share, I was telling David a little bit before the call, but here's the power of this power of zero. And I saw my uh, friend and, and mentor on the movie clip, Ed Slot. David, you know, Ed very well at this point, but uh, really fortunate to be able to work with David and his team. And of course, Ed and his team, the resources are just fabulous. Um, but I had two very distinct different strategy sessions with individuals I want to share with you. The first one um, was a uh, woman and we were going over her, her situation and the difference between when David tells you before and after. So if she had never met us and she continued on the tax deferred paradigm of investing just in her 401k and IRAs um, and spending what she wanted to spend, which was not, it was a modest amount of money. She was projected to run out of money at age 85. So her account value went to zero at age 85. So I'm here to tell you that my official CFP opinion is zero is no good if you're still alive, right? Um, just by doing things a little bit differently, doing really doing Roth conversions, Roth contributions, at age 85, she still had $500,000 left, one half of a million dollars left. That's the power of doing things differently. That is a life changer for her. Now, Another couple I talked to uh, just this evening uh, before the call, and I was telling Dave, David this, their difference, never met us, just continued to stay in the tax deferred paradigm, paid taxes in the future at the I don't know tax rate, um, the, and, and or being tax efficient, the difference over their lifetime was $5.7 million. $5.7 million. If that's not life changing, I just don't know what it is. Um, so these are very, very important studies that we do. I get very excited when we go through this and see these differences. So I'll do that for you. Uh, if for some reason, this, this is tech technology, not everything is perfect. If for some reason, uh, this page doesn't load for you, each one of you would have received an email from me. Uh, just reach out to uh, Newtown Yardley at planwithadvice.com. That's Newtown Yardley at planwithadvice.com and we'll get you scheduled. Now, if for some reason there's not, we can't find a place on the schedule for you, reach out to us and we'll make sure that um, we get you uh, fit in there. So David, let me ask you this. Um, some people are, are absolutely shell-shocked. It's easing a bit since the drop in the, the recent drop in the market. So you said it very, very well, but many people are just, in fear and sitting tight. Why should they really be acting now and taking advantage of some of these things like Roth conversions? Well, uh, because my fear is that, like, like I said uh, a couple minutes ago, we, uh, in, the, in the whole scope of history, there has never been a time that was more appropriate or more advantageous to get to the 0% tax bracket than uh, basically the next couple months. And the reason I say that is because once the recovery begins, once, once the shelter in place starts to end, I think that the stock market is gonna start recovering. So uh, you, gotta, you, you, you can pay tax on a lower amount or you can pay tax on a higher amount um, while tax rates are uh, on sale. So uh, remember the cost of getting to the 0% tax bracket is you gotta be willing to pay a tax. Do you wanna pay tax on a smaller amount of money or do you wanna pay tax on a larger amount of money? So uh, the stock market is sort of, in my mind, it's sort of artificially depressed. Once life returns to normal, um, then the assets are gonna rise right back to where they were, I think uh, eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually they will. We know that's just the nature of the stock market. And this is something that Ed Slot says over and over and over again. What is the single benefit from having the stock market go down? It's the perfect time to do Roth conversions. That's right. Can you tell me in your words, and I get this question a lot, <clears throat> people often raise their hand in, in class when we start talking about Roth conversions and they'll say, but, but, but more money makes more money. Right. So more money in the tax deferred makes more money. And, and aren't I given up opportunity by moving that? What's the break even? You've heard that. Can you yeah. address that? Yeah. So uh, a lot of people look at their 401k statement and it says a million dollars and they say, I've got a million dollars. But what you don't realize is that million dollars, that statement is really on the IRS's letterhead. Uh, <laughs> so you are a partner in the 
in that retirement savings account with the IRS. So if tax rates are say 30%, uh, really, technically speaking, only 70% of that money is yours. Well, what happens if tax rates in the future go up to 50%? Well, now all of a sudden, because you didn't convert to a Roth IRA while taxes were at 30%, now only 50% of that money is yours, okay? So in a rising tax rate environment, right now is always the best time to do a Roth conversion. You gotta remember that maybe your money doubles over time, but the IRS's portion of that money is gonna double right along with it. So you think that growth is accruing to you? No, only the portion that you own is accruing to you. The portion that the IRS owns accrues to them eventually when you end up paying the tax. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. Yes. Um, we do have a question and it's from Umberto. Umberto, good to see you or hear from you. And he says, David, can you comment on the Puerto, Puerto Rico tax laws? If I establish residency in Puerto Rico, what should the tax rate be on federal state capital gains and dividends? David, can you speak to this? I actually can. <laughs> <laughs> So um, if you have a qualifying business and you move to Puerto Rico, uh, they waive the federal tax, they waive the state tax, and they charge you a flat 4% tax. They also waive all of your capital gains tax, which is a pretty big deal if you're at a high marginal tax bracket. Um, so so they, they waive your capital gains tax, they, they waive uh, long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains, they waive it all. Uh, so there's a good, there's a reason why there's a lot of business owners that are moving to Puerto Rico. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Um, David, how has, um, how has this environment that we're in with the, all the mobile meetings or the, the, uh, you know, being quarantined, how does that really, how has it changed everything as far as day-to-day -day operations for your group and getting things done? Um, with uh, with your conversions and life insurance policies and things like that? You know, it's um, a lot of our advisors, and like I said, we got 250 power of zero advisors across the country, and a lot of them uh, had already had clients that were all across the country, and they were really accustomed uh, to doing um, business and, and administrative things with their clients online. And most companies these days have, even life insurance companies, uh, as it relates to the LIRP or investment companies, um, what have you, uh, they are, they've all transitioned very quickly to this new type and way of doing business. So uh, I would say that a lot of our advisors really haven't missed a beat because we have the ability to meet uh, with, our, with, our, with our clients uh, by internet, by webinar, uh, by GoToMeeting, by Zoom, uh, really as effectively. And the one thing that the people really like is they don't have to get in their car and drive in half an hour to meet us. So the whole, the whole kit and caboodle only takes about 45 minutes um, so it's actually something that a lot of people are warming up to quite nicely. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I had uh, purchased either laptops or surface pads uh, for everybody in the office in the fall with the idea that we, we have snow days here. I know you do in Wisconsin. So um, in thinking of inclement weather, I never thought that, of course, we'd have a global pandemic, but it really has been seamless. Uh, other than, you know, I had to ship a printer out to uh, Jessica for my office, but other than that, it really is business as usual. And I really don't, I remember working a lot in 2008, 2009, but I don't remember a time when I've been busier, frankly. It's just, I feel like I sit in this chair at seven, eight o'clock in the morning and I'm here until eight, nine o'clock at night, um, all with very positive things. So it's, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, my, my, my schedule, Mark, is already booked um, until almost every evening <laughs> and through June. So um, wow. yeah, we're not well, through, through the third week of June. So uh, we're not really missing a beat here on our end because we feel like there's a lot of people that are clamoring to get this type of information. Yeah, it's so important. And, and as I said, this, imp and I, I don't mean to, to puff you up here, David, but um, the, it's really such great understandable information and, and not that Ed Slot's information isn't because Ed's been presenting on PBS for years and Ed's one of the leading fundraisers for PBS and people love his program. But as far as getting information out to the populace and these university classes have just been tremendous for carrying that message and making people at least aware that there's a potential tax train and an issue. 
Uh, because wouldn't it be a shame if suddenly you're 80 years old and you're paying 40 whatever percent and you never saw it coming? Uh, it would really, really be a shame. So thank you. Uh, we, we do have a question. Uh, what's the rule to qualify for Roth conversions? I'm 56 years old, have IRA accounts from previous jobs. Yeah, so um, there's no income limit. Uh, back in 2011, they did away with the income limits uh, for Roth conversions. So if you're younger than 59 and a half, the only rule that really applies to you is you got to be willing um, to pay the tax on that Roth conversion from some other place besides the IRA itself. You have to have money sitting in your taxable bucket with which to pay the tax. Now, there is something interesting that uh, as a result of the CARES Act, um, they say that if, if because of, you know, as a result of COVID-19 reasons, you, you can take money uh, up to $100,000 out of your 401k or IRA, you could actually take that money out and pay it, uh, use it to pay tax on your Roth conversion. So that's actually a strategy. And I think they're a little bit more loosey goosey on um, whether you really have a honest to goodness reason that's related to COVID-19 for, 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 for taking advantage of that. So that's something that I know a lot of people are gonna be taking advantage of uh, over the course of the next three years. Yeah. Now, David, so that's interesting. Over the next the course, course of the next three years. So my understanding is you can take the distribution this year, um, but you have the next three years to pay the tax and to replenish it. Does that make sense? Or am I, yeah. am I misunderstanding so, that? So I'm, I'm talking specifically about doing a Roth conversion if you're younger than 59 and a half. Right. And you, um, and, and you wouldn't normally be able to do a Roth conversion or at least pay the tax out of the Roth conversion itself. All I'm saying is that you have the ability to pay the tax out of your IRA and not have the penalty like you normally would. That's Understood. all I was saying. Yes, right. Um, another question. You talk about, your, in your example, higher earners. How does the power of zero work for single individuals with limited assets? Um, well, it's, it's all relative, I suppose. If you're single, uh, your tax brackets go up twice as quickly, okay? Um, and when tax rates go up, if tax rates double, your tax rates are going to double right along with them. So um, the problem, you know, that they sort of discriminate against single people, you pay twice as much taxes as married people, uh, when you come right down to it. So um, I would say that this message is just as relevant to you as it is to a married couple um, because your tax rates are going to double right along with those married couples tax rates, only you're going to be uh, feeling the pain twice as much. So I, I would say this is even more relevant to single people than it is to, to married couples. Yeah, you know, and, and something that, you know, when you're teaching these classes, you often see the uh, when something resonates with folks, whether it's in the class or in your conference room, or now I guess on Zoom meetings. Um, one of them is when you mention that for a married couple in retirement, it's very likely that one of them or one of you are going to be suddenly single. And even if you want to argue the fact that, well, tax rates may not double over time, you and I believe it, and the majority of people we work with and, and teach believe it. But even if you want to argue that somehow there's going to be some catalyst that's not going to cause that. If you got a married couple, one of them is going to pass. And to your point, that's a double of taxation right there. Yep. And, and to layer on top of that, when I, when I pass away, my wife receives everything of mine, including my IRA, right? She then has to take required minimum distributions based on that IRA, which is still very high. And she suddenly has to pay tax. She's reduced down to one social security amount that's certainly going to be taxed up to 85%. So that is in itself a time bomb that if you don't mitigate anything else, that is something you should pay attention to. Do you agree? Yeah. And not to mention that if there's, if, if your wife has any money left over, it's going to go to your kids and they're going to be forced to pay tax on it over 10 years uh, at a period in time when tax rates are likely to be much higher than they are today at the apex of their earning years when they can least afford to pay the tax. Hey, kiss 50% of that IRA uh, goodbye before they ever really get to spend dollar one. Um, that was a huge cash grab on the part of the IRS um, that was part of the SECURE Act. So um, yeah, there's lots of positive things happen 
when you shift money to tax-free. If your spouse dies, you don't have to worry about that doubling of tax rates. If you wanna pass money on to a non-spouse beneficiary like your children, uh, you don't have to worry about them giving up 50% of it. So even if you feel like 30%, hey, that's a high tax rate, well, think about your surviving spouse, think about your kids well, that will likely have to pay double that. So um, lots of good things happen when you shift your money to tax free. Yeah, great point. You know, I've been, I've been saying for years, uh, talking about stretch IRAs and how they're, um, that's something you should take advantage of. And I've always been saying that they are going to disappear at some point. Well, here we are, right? Now we have under the, um, not the CARES Act, but the SECURE Act, the, now everything has to be distributed within that, those 10 years. And for you folks that live in Pennsylvania, David, I don't know if you, if you remember this, but Pennsylvania is a pension friendly state. So no tax on pensions, no tax on qualified IRA distributions. Nice. That, yeah, but it's not forever, right? Oh, That's going to change at some right. point because not only do we have all the obligations we talked about on the federal level for you, but uh, that you spoke about, but we have them on each state level. So in New Jersey, my clients and the people li listening here in New Jersey, you've got pension problems in New Jersey. Um, Pennsylvania, we've got pension problems in Pennsylvania. If I could just tell you one little uh, a snippet here, I serve on our local board of directors for our local school district. I've been, this is my seventh year now. Uh, my first year on the board, our pension payment obligation to the state for our employees was just a little over $5 million. We have a $250 million budget. It's a big organization. That's a lot of money, $5 million that we had to send. Now, just six, seven years later, our pension obligation is $38 million that we have to send every year. I believe it. And it's not going down, it's going up. They said it was gonna level, but they lied, right? <laughs> they said, oh, we were just kidding. You have more to send. So that you, even your state taxes, anything that you can push over to tax free uh, is going to make a big difference. Um, we have another question from Umberto. Uh, I have just done the Roth conversion and I'm not quite 59 and a half years old. How quickly should I send the check to the IRS uh, for the taxes due on the conversion and avoid a penalty? So I'm going to qualify this before you answer, David. Uh, you, Umberto, you should definitely talk to a C I'm not a CPA. I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't do tax preparation. You should definitely consult your CPA for this, but David, do you want to take that? I would say pretty soon they will, they will charge you. It's like, you know, it's like, business owner, you pay quarterly taxes. Um, if you wait till the end of the year before you pay that, there will be interest and penalties. So you want to pay that typically right away. You either have the, you know, the fiduciary withhold the tax and send it to the IRS. And if they don't withhold the tax and you want to pay it out of your taxable bucket or what have you, you then, then you do that. Just make sure that you send it right away. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there are some ways that you can do quarterly estimates and things like that, Umberto, but it typically they want those taxes paid with uh, the, the at the end of the quarter when you do the distrib the uh, conversion, but definitely you want to consult your tax preparer, preferably a CPA with that question, but thanks for the question. And, you know, here's a good point with that. When you start down the road of Roth conversions, which so many of us should be doing and contributions, you've got to have a team in place there. This gets complicated. So not only do, must you map out the, mathematically ideal amounts every year that you should be converting and that you should have in each bucket. But I'm here to tell you, and I think David, you can back this up is that is going to change. It's going to change just about every year, the amount that you're going to convert. Um, you should have your team being from an estate planning point of view, a, a, at least an estate planning attorney, maybe an estate attorney and an elder law attorney, a qualified CPA, a qualified financial planner. And it should be someone who is aware of Roth conversion strategies, Roth conversion speed bumps, um, Roth conversion issues, and somebody that focuses on this. I am always amazed when I see my friends in the Slack group that there's only 400 of us in the entire country. Think about how many financial advisors are out there. Only 400 of us dedicate the time uh, and expense, frankly, to learn these strategies to stay on top of it. So make sure you're finding the right people because when you make mistakes, it can be very, very costly. And we can't undo Roth conversions anymore, right? That recharacterization, we used to be able to have it until October 15th of the year following the year you did the conversions to undo them and we don't have that anymore. Uh, so mistakes are, are critical. Okay.
David, any closing comments? Well, I just, uh, only that I hope people take this message to heart. And um, there's, like I said, there's never in the, in the history, in the last hundred years, there's probably never a better time than right now to implement these types of strategies. So just, if you feel uh, sort of aroused to your faculties and you feel impressed by what we talk about tonight, I would just say take action and um, do it before, um, before you forget about it. Because it's, you know, life gets back in the way again. You want to uh, strike while the iron's hot here and, and, and make some decisions uh, to take advantage of some of these strategies before the stock market goes back up again and certainly before tax rates go back up again. Yeah, great. Yeah, and, and like I said, you're going to be getting my calendar when we close out this meeting, if everything works well. And, uh, and if it doesn't, reach out to us and we'll make sure that we schedule time with you. But I'm going to, I'm going to give you an hour of my time to go over your personal strategy. Um, uh, there are times when uh, David looks, you know, I'll, I'll call David with a question as well. So we've got a lot of, lot of heads in the game here and able to help you with it. But that said, folks, um, David, if you have nothing else, thank you very much for being here. That was really excellent. I, nobody does that better, obviously. Um, you know, you can order these books on Amazon. If you schedule a, uh, a meeting with us and you want a copy of it, just let me know and I'll send one out to you. Um, another book that I like that, uh, that David has is Look Before You Lerp. Um, this is, a, you know, it's a, it's a funny um, title, but it fits really well. Uh, and this is about the life insurance retirement plans. Spells it out really, really nicely. And again, if, you, if you're a reader and you'll read these, I'm happy to forward them to you. Um, so that said, folks, thanks and uh, have a good night. And David, thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Mark. Good night. Thank you. Hello again. I hope you enjoyed the video and perhaps you learned something new that can help you. If you want to schedule time for me for a no cost, no obligation consultation, you can use the link in the description and schedule a time that works best for you. If my schedule is full and you can't find anything, don't worry. Send us an email and we'll find a time that works for you. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you. Have a great day.